What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Fish of Hex. My name is Travis. Today's video, we're doing another email Q&A. Now, if you're new to the channel, this is where I sit down and answer your guys' questions that you send into fishofhex at gmail.com. And of course, all of these questions will be answered in the order in which they're received. It's like a freaking robot recording every time I do that. Anyway, uh, so I do want to mention one thing real quick. So since this is my first email Q&A, since I added some stuff to the channel, um, this particular question that we're starting with is back in August of 2019. So needless to say, it takes a little while to catch up on all the questions. Now, what you can do is you can bypass this and go straight to the join membership section here on YouTube, which I implemented, I think the beginning of last month or middle of last month, whatever. And all you have to do is sign up for the Q and a section. And I put a post up like this every single day. And all you have to do is put your questions in the comment section, as many as you have and all that good stuff. And they will be answered within 24 hours. And uh, yeah, it worked out pretty good. People like it so far. So I'm going to keep doing it now. With all that said, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so our first question, I have a ghost white ribbon eel. I know that they are very hard to get to eat, but when I first bought mine, he would eat anything that I would give him. Uh, live ghost shrimp, frozen silver sides, mysis shrimp, krill shrimp. Now after having him for over six months, he has stopped eating completely. Uh, he is breathing heavily and fast. Uh, also, side of his gills are wider uh, than he usually is when he's breathing. Uh, please help me with any advice. I'm worried that I don't know if he's getting sick or anything like that. So, okay. So, you guys know that I had uh, Reggie the Snowflake Eel for a couple years. And he ended up dying uh, because he, well, he stopped eating. And then he got an infection. It was like a bacterial infection. You could tell because he started turning red, getting red streaks on his body. He was laying on his side. And then eventually he passed away before I can... Get, I want to get him out and get him in quarantine, try to get some medication, but it happened relatively quickly, and it, it, he wouldn't let you catch him unless he was too sick to kind of get away, and that's kind of where I was at when I caught him in the 300. So um, that's my experience with eels up to that point, and I'll tell you right now, if, if when it comes to eels, they can go a couple months without eating. I know that Reggie would go like two months without eating, and he would be fine. Uh, sometimes when I was adding new fish, it stressed him out, and he didn't want to go out and eat. Um, after he got done eating all the chromuses, he didn't want to eat any other fish. Um, you know, I wouldn't worry about the eating thing too much. Eels can go a little while without it. But if he's laying on his side, he's starting to show like the red streaks around his gills or his face. I'm not sure what that exactly was. I'm pretty, I'm, I'm almost positive it was a bacterial infection of some sort. I never really know um, because I never looked into it farther than the fact that I, you know, had to pull him out and he died within a couple hours. But um, yeah, so if he's not eating, I wouldn't worry too too much unless it's been for like three four months. That's probably going to be a huge problem for him. Um, but also, uh, he might be, you know, snacking on some of your little fish while you're sleeping at night. You know, if you're seeing fish missing, that might be something you might want to look into. But uh, like I said, if he's laying on his side and he's not breathing right, he's really, really struggling, he's not out moving around, that could be an indication that there's a bacterial, some kind of infection. At that point, you might want to add some probiotics to the tank to kind of help with that. I'm not really sure what medications you can add because I didn't get to that point when it came to Reggie. And honestly, I, I'm not ever going to have another snowflake eel. I think Reggie was the one and done, and I'm just not something I'm going to get again. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully, uh, well, it's been a while, so feel free to let me know how it turned out. I'd be interested to know. All right, man? Thanks. All right, next question. I'm building a garage sump for my 65-gallon mixed reef, and I just saw your video on the 75-gallon basement sump. I was wondering if you have any plans on how to put the sump together, uh, particularly the dividers in the tank height, since I'm planning on uh, preventing bubbles. Um, it's kind of mixed around there in words. Also, where do you di uh, drip the calcium? Uh, first things first, when it comes to dripping calcium and alkalinity, it doesn't matter where you drip them as long as they're not dripping at the same time. So if you want to dose something, dose it uh, half an hour apart. That's what I used to do on the 125. You know, uh, you know, calcium every hour on the hour and then alkalinity every half an hour on that half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, whatever. And uh, that just prevents them from coming together. So it doesn't matter where you put them in as long as they're not being dosed at the same time. Second, second part of the uh, question here, when it comes to um, plans for a sump, I have a couple videos on the channel. I know the 125 had a DIY sump. Of course, there are two client builds that have DIY sums, Jeff's and uh, that basement sump that you saw. Uh, when it comes to uh, putting the dividers in, it really depends on what you want to do. Do you want to have a refugium? A lot of people give me shit about putting the refugium on the far section. Uh, the reason why I do that, and that's before the skimmer, the reason why I do that is because if you put it anywhere else in the tank, it's not going to be as big as it can possibly be. So when you put it on the far end of a, of a tank, you can build it up and have it as high as you want. Then that water just simply has to flow down into a lower section, like the skimmer section, and then into a uh, even a lower section, like your return section. So, um, And people are always worried about uh, pods and shit getting sucked up in the skimmer. If you have a healthy refugium and a healthy reef tank, you don't have to worry about pods getting sucked up in this skimmer. What ones do, it is what it is. Um, you know, it's not going to make a big difference. So um, I would say make sure that the baffles are um, 
thick enough to support the weight. I usually, I usually do half an inch if possible on all my baffles. Um, if it's a smaller tank, like a 20 gallon or something like that for a sump, you can use the, uh, I think the glass from Lowe's or Home Depot. You can do that. They can cut it for you as well. And, um, just make sure you have thick enough baffles for the big enough tank and also uh, make sure that the water level is good for your skimmer. It doesn't hurt to be um, around that midpoint. You could even go a little bit higher in your skimmer or even a little bit lower because you can adjust. And you can also put egg crate and stuff into the um, sections to raise the skimmer up or lower it down. Uh, just try to get around the recommended um, height for your skimmer and then of course make sure you have enough room for the pump, uh, the return pump, the skimmers and the heaters. All right, so hopefully that answers your question. All right, next question. Hi, I just watched one of your videos on Facebook. I'm currently have a yellow tang and a blue hippo tang in my tank, and I want to add a sailfin tang. Any advice? All right, so the uh, facial structure is something that you have to take into consideration when you're adding tangs to a tank. A lot of people don't talk about this, but usually fish that have the same facial structure will be more aggressive to each other. So um, you're looking at a yellow tang and a sailfin tang that have the same facial structure. Now, um, I've never heard of a hippo tang being an asshole to anybody, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. So what I would do if I were you is I would add a sailfin tang that is the same exact size as your yellow tang if not a little bit bigger that way when you put them together they will kind of beat up on each other and then move on with their lives if you get a smaller sailfin tang there's a good chance that the yellow will just back him into a corner and fin, fin slap the shit out of him until he dies so um yeah you didn't say how big your tank was, but if you do have the ability, adding multiple tangs at the same time is always recommended. Definitely spreads out the aggression. So uh, good luck with that. Okay, our next question is from Metal Man Mick. Hey, dude, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for all your videos. I'm starting out slow and steady with a 16-gallon Ocean Free Nano. I just got a scooter blenny so far. I want a pair of black and white clowns, a cleaner shrimp, a snail, maybe a bicolor blenny. Uh, but the bio load might be too much, question mark. Um, bio load, I don't think that's going to be too much. 16-gallon tank, you got one, two, three, four fish, a cleaner shrimp, and a couple snails. I don't think that's going to be a big deal, but I would still uh, do at least a 30% water change every single week um and then you guys know that clownfish don't stay small forever they will get big um it does take a while though most likely you'll be upgraded by then especially if you're, you're just starting out um so i wouldn't worry about the milk growing the tank too much just keep an eye on your nitrates and uh, phosphates just to make sure you're not overfeeding uh the rest of the email here is uh with my tank should i take out the back sump media cartridge apparently they become a nitrate factory it has three cartridges and a skimmer. I want to leave the I want to leave the sponge to collect shit and a carbon cartridge, uh, but re, but remove the other two uh, that have ceramic ring media biofoam in it. Um, yeah, I I would remove anything that's going to be uh, collecting a uh, junk. Um, I do notice that when I had an all-in-one tank, that 30 gallon, I did have bio media, bio balls and stuff in the back. That stuff just collected nutrients uh, because there wasn't a ton of flow going through it. Uh, it just was a nitrate factory, it was an issue. So I ended up removing all that media and it got better. Now you definitely want to leave a sponge in there to collect and just make sure it makes the tank look a little bit clearer of course the skimmer uh, section is good to go and then, then you want the carbon to remove anything as usual so yeah just remove any of the bio stuff and anything extra spongy wise that you're not going to be using and you'll be good to go um the rest of the email here is uh the 13 pounds of rock uh should be enough for filtration i don't see why not that's uh, almost a pound per gallon. That should be fine. Um, it pretty much comes down to what works for you. Uh, that should be good. Um, I uh, could use the space for an auto top off uh, valve, another heater, and some uh, way to keep a Cocoa Pods breeding in there. Um, now, yeah, so you have the extra space when you take out that media and those, you know, those ceramic rings and stuff like that. I wouldn't worry about trying to grow Cocoa Pods or Refugium or anything like that. Uh, I do know that they have mini ones that you can, like, magnet on the side of your tank and it grows macroalgae and that stuff i wouldn't really worry about that making things too complex you said you are just starting off just do the skimmer weekly water change of 30 percent get rid of anything that's going to collect detritus don't overstock the tank keep an eye on your nitrates and phosphates and enjoy the hobby and enjoy the ride all right man hopefully that helps all right our next question is from aaron Hi, Travis. Man, I got a problem. I have a 25-gallon cube that I set up about four months ago. Over the last uh, two and a half months, my DKH has been slowly creeping from 7 to 12.7. I am using the salt water that I buy from the local fish store. He is using Fritz RPM Blue Box. I do a 2.5-gallon water change every week, and it makes no difference. My alkalinity just keeps going up. I don't dose anything. Have you ever in your life heard of anything like this? I have uh, asked everyone in the Reef Club and beyond. Um, there's not really much information that you've given me. Uh, have you checked your magnesium? If your magnesium is really low, you're going to have a misbalance between alkalinity and calcium. It's not going to be able to stay stable within your tank. Check the magnesium level. Uh, if, he's just, if you're just using Fritz, the magnesium is pretty good in there, so that shouldn't be a problem unless, you know, for whatever reason it's not. Um, 
And also, what are you testing with? Are you testing with Red Sea? Are you testing with Hannah Checker? Are you test using multiple test kits? Are the test kits expired? Um, also, are you testing the water before you put it in your tank? What is the alkalinity that is going into the tank directly? Um, I would assume that you have checked these things um, just because you know you you want to know what your source water is so i would check your alkalinity your calcium your magnesium from your source water um my last question which um you know i would think that the reef club members would have probably brought this up is are you using an ato what is your salinity at um are you topping off with salt water uh, a lot of people do that in the beginning and uh, ends up creeping up the salinity in turn creeping up the alkalinity because um, usually uh fritz is around nine nine five right out of the box especially that blue box and um, never had any other issues with that. So I would say uh, check to see what the alkalinity is coming in and make sure you're topping off with um, RODI water and not salt water. And also double check your test kits um, because if you're not dosing anything, you're not adding two-part calc or anything like that, there's really no reason why it would go up uh, unless it's your source water or your testing method is flawed. Um, so double check that. It doesn't hurt to have some friends come over and use their test kits. I use reliable stuff like a Hannah checker. Um, and also, check, you know, I use the Milwaukee for my salinity. Make sure it's calibrated, though. All right. So hopefully, uh, you know, Aaron, if you get this, let me know what you figured out. It's been, a, it's been a few months. So let me know what you figured out. All right. All right. Next question is from David. Hi there. Watched a bunch of your videos and I can't seem to wrap my head around this. Please help me. Um, I've been using Zeovit for about six months now. Well, there's your fucking problem. You're using Zeovit. No, I'm just playing. Um, I've been using Zeovit for about six months now, uh, and my PO4 and my NO3 are ultra low. That's what it's used for. But I can't get my elk and calcium dialed in. I dose 11 milliliters of elk and zero calcium daily. Elk is stable at 7.6, and calcium raise, rises to uh, daily to uh, 467 to 476. Uh, today it's at 512. Magnesium is 1400. I use Red Sea. Um, Blue bucket at uh, 1.026 salinity. What should I do to balance it out? Stop dosing and a huge water change, um, or I do I dump I uh, or do I do I up my dosing a 12 milliliters of calcium alkaline a day? All right, so um, this is something that happens to people all the time. First of all, stop using fucking Zeovit. I don't know why you're using Zeovit. That's old technology. I tried in the beginning. It, running these ultra ultra low nutrient systems are a huge pain in the ass and they cost too much money. So get rid of Zeovit for one. But if you're gonna keep it. Um, what I would do is because you're you're dosing one and not the other, they're never going to have a chance to uh, balance out. I know that you're using the blue bucket. I, have you tested the water going into your tank from the blue bucket? You might have got a batch that has really, really freaking high um, uh, calcium. So check. If you have issues like this, always check your water that's going in before you put it in the tank. It gives you a good idea of kind of what you're feeding it. And... Uh, so check to see what you're at on there. Maybe you got a bad batch. Maybe you know, maybe it's stupid high, and you're just getting the levels from that. But what I would do is, if it's normal, say you're at uh, you know 425 calcium, and you're getting you know nine uh, DKH from the blue bucket, whatever. Then I would just increase your alkalinity uh, dosing, and also make sure you're dosing equal parts of calcium. They will balance out over time. If you want to, because you are at a pretty big extreme now, you could always do a 30% water change every a couple days for about a week. That will help balance things out as long as the water you're putting in there is good to go and it's balanced itself. Again, if you have really high numbers and an off batch, then of course you'd want to dump that batch and get a new one and start over with that. But um, you want to increase the amount because it will balance itself out. You never want to be adding one over the other. You always want to be equal parts of calcium and alkalinity. That's the way it's designed. That's the way calcium reactors are designed. That's the way um, a calc wasser works by when you know, you're know you dosing one, you should always dose another. It's always adding equal parts into the water column because when corals grow, they pull out equal parts. Now, there are exceptions for clams and shit like that that pull out more of another, but we don't need to get into all of that. Um, so just increase the amounts if the water itself is fine. If your water that you're putting in the tank is off, then get a new box or bucket or try new salt and go from there. So hopefully uh, that answers your question. All right, moving on to our last question for this video is from Angelo. First off, let me thank you for your service to our country. Uh, no problem. Uh, question, I am doing hypo in my display tank. Live rock, live sand, hermit crabs, uh, cleaner shrimp, and a condi anemone. Um, okay. Um, are they okay to go down to nine salinity or will 11 work? Um, I also have fish in there. It looks like two are infected and there are four but two have lost the spots. Is this my, this is my first year and I already lost 23 fish. I'm ready to give up on the hobby, uh, but I love uh, the, okay. All right. So uh, yeah, um, I would not put a display tank in hyposalinity unless it's a fish only tank. Um, 
Hermit crabs seem to be okay for the most part on that, but I would, I just, yeah, it's just you're in bad territory, man. I would not put the display tank in hypo salinity. I would remove all of the fish and then put the tank back to normal 1.025 or 2.6 or whatever the hell you had it at before and then put the fish in quarantine let the fi let the tank go fallow for 10 weeks so that ick parasite i'm assuming you have ick you said spots uh that the ick will just die on its own because it doesn't have a food source and then quarantine the fish and treat them with hypo or copper to get rid of the uh parasite in my seat's cranking um but uh yeah i i i definitely do not recommend dropping a tank with any other thing anything other than fish in it uh, and some inverts down into hyposalinity. That's bad juju. I would not do it. Um, so cut it, cut it out. Put the tank back to normal and, and catch the fish. And I'm guessing the reason why you lost 23, 23 fish already this year is because you're not quarantining. And everybody knows on this channel that I'm going to go off on a tangent with quarantine, but I'm not this time. Uh, there's plenty of videos on the channel where you need to learn how to quarantine. So do it or you're going to continue to have this happen. 23 fish is 100% unacceptable. On every single level you should not be killing 23 fish in your first year of this hobby um i'm just i'm not gonna be an asshole about it because you know you sent me the email and stuff but you shouldn't be killing 23 fish so uh basically you know get your shit together and start quarantining your fish um if you can't do it then maybe the hobby isn't for you so that's 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 my two cents and i'm gonna leave it at that so, uh, yeah, hope you guys uh, like the video. My freaking throat's getting sore. I've been here talking and dry shit down here. So I will uh, see you guys later with another video. I'm going to try to get a rambling out tomorrow because i got to catch up on some stuff for the new year. So I'll talk to you guys later. All right, peace.